Okay, let's go ahead and start. So today we want to finish off retroviruses, HIV specifically. So we left off talking about the initial stages of HIV infection. And so remember that HIV actually uses two different co-receptors and the virus tends to mutate after infecting. Uh, human. So about, oh, more than 50% of people who are infected chronically with HIV over time will change the kind of virus that they have in terms of its tropism. It will switch from using the CCR5 co-receptor to using the CCR or CXCR4 receptor, which now is probably uh, a bad harbinger because now this gives access to the, of the to the virus to virtually all of the T cells in the, in the patient. Uh, so this is probably what results in the profound, very profound loss of, of immune function in advanced HIV infections or, or AIDS. But regardless of which of these co-receptors are used, the entrance is largely the same, the, the access to a, to a new cell. So this is just uh, a series of slides that I found on the web that uh, have a little bit of a problem with them, but for the most part, I, I kind of like the way this treats the entry of HIV into, into cells. So it's the um, HIV glycoprotein 120, which initiates this interaction. So what's shown here on the left is the HIV glycoproteins and the matrix protein, as well as the viral envelope of HIV. So this lipid bilayer on the left Here's the GP120, sometimes referred to as the SU protein for surface protein. That's, um, that term gets used analogously with GP120. This is the protein that's going to actually now interact with both the CD4, that's the constant receptor, so any cell that's going to be infected by HIV must have this cluster of differentiation number four antigen, as well as one of the co-receptors, either CCR5 or CXCR4. That interaction that occurs by means of the SU protein or GP120 with the receptor and the co-receptor is going to cause a very profound conformational change in that assemblage of glycoproteins. The um, GP120 is largely going to fall off, and then what that's going to do is going to allow for the insertion of this GP41, or at least a portion of it, not only within the lipid bilayer of the viral envelope, but within the lipid bilayer of now the host cell. And now this slide actually shows the contents that are inside of this virus that, that are about to gain access to the host cell. And some of these we've already discussed, but one we haven't yet, so I want to bring that up. So if you look on the inside here, you see the two identical copies of the RNA genome the enzyme reverse transcriptase, which is coming in preformed, the enzyme integrase, the enzyme protease, which is involved in, in um, for instance, cleaving GP160 into 41 and 120. And then here's the molecule, although it's not shown uh, particularly anatomically correct, uh, that we haven't mentioned yet. There is always a tRNA molecule, a specific tRNA molecule inside the HIV virion, and this is probably the case with all retroviruses, but certainly in the case of HIV, there is a specific transfer RNA molecule which comes with the virus and, and has to, and you'll see why when we talk about the process of reverse transcription. This tRNA is actually serves as the primer for reverse transcription. But in either case, we'll come to that in a little while. So, but what we're talking about now is just the ability to fuse the viral envelope with the host membrane. So here you'll see in the next slide, in the next stages, the surface protein, the SU or GP120 protein is gone, and now you're beginning to see the insertion of a portion of the GP41 into the host membrane about to be infected. And this accomplishes the exact same thing that the hemagglutinin did in the influenza story. Remember that the conformation changes in the hemagglutinin 
accomplished by acidity caused a portion of the of that hemagglutinin protein to insert into the host membrane, the endosome membrane, and to bring those two lipid bilayers so close together that they will actually fuse. And that's what's shown here in this, in this next slide. You can see the fusion of these two lipid bilayers. And now what's being released into the cytoplasm is the nucleocapsid um, core of the HIV particle. This has within it, within this mate, or these group antigen proteins, these, these proteins on the outside of this capsid are made up of what's known or, or are encoded by the gene called GAG, or group antigens. These proteins, as well as perhaps some other proteins associated with HIV, have nuclear localization or nuclear targeting signals. This is going to allow this mole this, this complex of molecules to actually be imported into the nucleoplasm of the cells via nuclear pore complex. There's one, I think, problem with this set of slides, and, and, and I'll correct this in, in, a, in a few minutes, is that this is showing that the RNA genomes are going to be imported directly as RNA into the nucleus of, of the cell. That's actually not true. During this cytoplasmic phase, during the transition or, or the transit time from the entry of this nucleocapsid until the import through the nuclear membrane, this is when the process of reverse transcription occurs, is in the cytoplasm. This particular set of slides has it slightly wrong. It's showing that RNA, the RNA genomes are being dumped into the nucleus. By the time this molecule, these molecules make it, into the nucleoplasm, this RNA has been turned from um, single-stranded RNA into double-stranded RNA copies with the long terminal repeats. But it's correct that the other products are also put into the, nucle into the nucleus at the same time. The integrase protein, very critical, because the integrase protein is what's going to take the double-stranded DNA genome and insert it into the host chromosome. Okay, so now let's go back and look at, at the genome. So, so the genome, as it came into that cell, prior to being turned into double-stranded DNA by reverse transcriptase, um, has the exact same structure as a host messenger RNA. It has a 5-prime methylguanosine cap. It has a 3-prime poly A tail. So it's exactly the same as a host messenger RNA. So why does this virus bother to convert itself into DNA and insert itself into the chromosome when even at the point of infection, this RNA molecule could be translated by a ribosome? And what you're going to see later is that when this RNA is regenerated from the nucleus, sent back out into the cytoplasm, it is bound by ribosomes and it will be translated. So why go through all of this complicated um, genetic acrobats, uh, acrobatics to, to turn into DNA and put itself into the, into the chromosome? Um, so why not just translate itself? So you don't have quite, unless you've, got, unless you've already taken virology or learned this in another class, you don't quite have the answer to this yet. But think about this question because um, I can guarantee you that there is an exam question very much related to this. And it really has something to do with this process that you've probably all seen before, but maybe not, maybe not in the detail that we're about to go through it. And that's reverse transcriptase. So you've probably seen at some point uh, a very simple equation like this where reverse transcriptase has an enzyme activity that takes RNA and turns it into DNA. Well, it is true. Reverse transcriptase has the ability to do that, but it's a lot more complex than, than that. As a matter of fact, what I think people don't appreciate is the fact that um, despite the fact that this viral enzyme can synthesize DNA from RNA, it actually has three very distinctive enzymatic activities. And it has, of course, the one that you would guess without even knowing any more than, than what I've told you. It is an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. That is what you think of as the definition of reverse transcriptase. And, and actually, that is the definition of reverse 
transcriptase. It's reverse from central dogma. But it also has, in order to function properly, this same enzyme, reverse transcriptase, reverse transcriptase must also be a DNA-dependent DNA polymerase, similar to ours, although it lacks proofreading activity. Um, and it also has to have a third, and does have a third enzymatic activity called RNase H. The H here stands for hybrid. This enzyme has the ability to break down RNA when RNA is existing as an RNA-DNA hybrid. So these are the three enzymatic activities for which reverse transcriptase um, is known. So let's go through the process of, of reverse transcriptase step by painful step. So I mentioned that there's a specific tRNA molecule that comes in at the time of infection with the virion already formed, stolen from the previous host cell. This tRNA molecule, shown here in the top as this inverted L, binds to an area of the retroviral RNA genome known as the PBS or primer binding site. That's what PBS stands for. So I know this projector isn't projecting the colors very well here, but just um, as we go through these steps, remember that RNA is shown anytime you see a molecule in red, it's RNA. The tRNA molecule is shown in pink. And once we start to make DNA from this, you'll see that in green. So I mentioned that the tRNA molecule actually serves as a primer. So this three prime end of this tRNA bound to the primer binding site of the HIV genome can now be extended by reverse transcriptase using that first activity, that classic activity that you know RT has. It is an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. So you'll see that the first portion of the genome of HIV to be copied is this unique five prime sequence and the terminal repeat, R. So now you'll see that this is, this is DNA at this point. Now, um, in step three shown on this slide, you'll see a second enzymatic activity of reverse transcriptase, and that is the RNase-H activity. Because what happens in this next step is that reverse transcriptase, or RT, will degrade that portion of the chromosome, the RNA chromosome of HIV, which, is been, which just served as the template to make the DNA copy of repeat and U5. So that part of the RNA genome is gone. Why this is so important at this particular point is because now it leaves this repeat sequence at the DN in the DNA form, having com complete perfect homology with the RNA repeat at the three prime end of the genome. And so this slide kind of makes it look as if this tRNA DNA segment magically hops down to the other end. In reality, there are two competing models for how this magic jump occurs. Probably the best accepted one is a circularization. So that this RNA molecule shown in step three can actually circularize itself and now that DNA repeat sequence can bind to its RNA copy at the three prime end. And now that can perhaps move that newly synthesized segment to the other end. The, the other model, which I don't think is well accepted, actually may have to do with the fact that there are two identical RNA genomes within that virus. And so perhaps um, this is donated by the other genome fragment that's undergoing reverse transcriptase at the same time. And I think there are adherents to both of those models. But I think the circularization model is, is more frequently taught. But it's still not without controversy. In either case, this newly synthesized piece of RNA, still attached to its RNA primer, is moved down to the three prime end of this now somewhat shortened RNA genome. And now that serves as a primer for reverse transcriptase activity again. And that's what's shown in five. Now, using that sequence as a primer, its reverse transcriptase makes a DNA copy of the rest of that RNA genome all the way down through the primer binding site at the, at the other side. Now, 
after step five, the RNase H activity steps in again. So that's what's shown here. You'll notice that in step six down here at the bottom of the slide, you'll see that the majority, but not the entirety, but the majority of the RNA genome has now been degraded. So RNase H activity has degraded that hybrid RNA, but it has left behind at this particular point a particular tract that's um, very rich in purines, called the polypurine tract. So this is a tract that would have a large amount of guanosines um, and adenines. So this section, at this particular point, for reasons that certainly I don't understand, RNase H activity does not degrade that polypurine tract at this particular point. And that's important because that polypurine tract will now serve as a primer itself. So reverse transcriptase is now going to prime from the three prime end of that polypurine tract and synthesize at the DNA level the unique three prime sequence, the repeat sequence, and the U5 sequence, and the primer binding site. There is something, let's say magical, about this particular arrangement of the RNA-DNA hybrid at this point. Because at this point, RNase H acquires the activity to degrade every piece of RNA that's bound to that DNA. So in the next step, shown here in A, RNase H activity now gets the ability to degrade that polypurine tract and also degrades the tRNA primer. So now the only thing that's left here is DNA, but it's not quite finished yet. It now uses this third activity. So this is the first time, I think, oh, no, it's not the first time, but, but now you're seeing the DNA-dependent DNA polymerase activity of reverse transcriptase. Um, this sequence, again, at the three prime end of this newly synthesized RNA, G, DNA genome, can now, probably via circularization, be moved down to the configuration you see in step nine. Because the primer binding site now is repeated at both the three prime end of this small fragment generated in step eight. There's perfect homology with the primer binding site on the three prime end of that larger fragment. And so now you have the situation to finish off the generation of the double-stranded retroviral DNA. You have two free three prime ends. And remember that DNA polymerases always put nucleic acids onto the three prime end. So this strand serves as a primer to synthesize the remaining portion of the lower strand. The upper strand now serves as a, pro, as a free three prime hydroxyl group to put on nucleotides to the other end. So that finally what you have at step 10 is the completed form, the, the double-stranded DNA copy of the retroviral genome, but it's not identical. And I'm not talking now necessarily about mutations which could have occurred because reverse transcriptase does not have proofreading activity. So it's probably possibly made some nucleotide changes in here. But it's also made a very important change in these repeat sequences. I'm going to go back a slide just for a second just to remind you that as the genome came in, at the RNA level, it had direct repeats, 5 prime end and 3 prime end. Now look at the the finished product of the double-stranded DNA. It's gone from a repeat sequence to what we now refer to as the LTR, or long terminal repeat. And they're identical on both ends. In essence, what we've done at the DNA level is added a copy of the unique three prime sequence to now the five prime end. So what was just a repeat sequence is now the long terminal repeat. And it's the same on both ends of this. The long terminal repeat, as you're about to see, becomes really important for the expression of retroviral genes inside the host. These long terminal repeats shown here, so this is, you're not seeing the, the um, entirety of this double-stranded DNA. It's, it's sh shown here circular. So you're seeing one end, and here's the other end. They have a few free nucleotides on each end that the RNA, excuse me, that reverse transcriptase has put in. Now, using that enzyme that came in at the time of infection, integrase, that preformed viral enzyme that has to be present in the, inside the nuclear capsid, this 
these long terminal repeats are now going to be moved randomly into the chromosome, generating direct repeats. So here is just a random sequence represented as UVWXYZ in the host chromosome. Integrase is going to cut that sequence, kind of like transposase does, um, and insert this double-stranded DNA into there. And you'll see that a couple of nucleotides are lost in the process here. Um, but what's important is that what ends up being put in here is the, the long terminal repeat, U3R, U5, all of the genetic material encoding the genes, the gag pollen on genes of the retrovirus, and then an identical long terminal repeat at, at the other end. So now this looks just like any other piece of DNA within, within the host cell. But these long terminal repeats are actually what drives transcription of HIV and, or any other retrovirus. So here's, here's the um, arrangement. Here's the host DNA. Here is the long terminal repeat with its unique 3' prime R and U5 sequence. If you blow this up and look at what the sequences are within that long terminal repeat, you begin to see why this process of reverse transcription was so important. You now have within that U3 sequence all of the DNA sequences that are necessary to induce transcription. So in the case of HIV, there is a um, MF kappa B site for inducing the, the transcription of these genes. So NF kappa B is, um, for those of you who haven't taken cell biology yet or didn't learn this in earlier biology classes, NF kappa B is a set of cytoplasmic proteins that remain in the cytoplasm until the cell is stimulated, generally by some kind of an inflammatory response. So a cell that gets activated by something like a cytokine will now cause NF-kappa B proteins to enter into the nucleus and bind to these particular sites to initiate transcription. SP1 binds another transcription factor. That, that can bind here to start transcription. And then the Tata box is that central region that's responsible for binding RNA polymerase II, or one of the factors of RNA polymerase II. The important point is not so much the details of what these binding sites are for transcription factors, is the fact that this sequence, now in the long, now in the long terminal repeat, is able to recruit at specific times all of the necessary materials to begin the expression of HIV-1, beginning right here. This arrow pointing to the right denotes the exact point at which transcription is going to begin. So you see that the RNA that's going to be generated is not going to have the long terminal repeat. Because remember, when we talked about promoters before, the promoter sequence and the um, enhancer sequences are not transcribed. They initiate transcription here, and they generate a piece of messenger RNA that's going to look exactly, precisely like the genome that came into that host cell that started this whole process before reverse transcription. So this unique three sequence contains an array of binding sites for all of the cellular transcription factors that are necessary um, for the virus to replicate. So that's what's. So, so now let's talk a little bit more about the specifics of the expression of these viral RNA molecules. Because this is going to go back to that question that I posed a few slides ago as to why is it that the viral mRNA, as it's put into the host cell at the time of infection, why is it not translated directly? It has to do with the proper expression of the proteins from HIV or whatever retrovirus we happen to be talking about. And it depends on differential splicing. So you can have, from the host cell, the, the generation of full-length messenger RNA that will allow for the expression of the gag proteins and the polymerase proteins. Um, but there's a stop code on after the polymerase protein, such that this transcript, which is exactly the same transcript that was the genome coming into the cell, can never be translated past the polymerase. What happens is that at some frequency inside the nucleus, when this transcript is made, some of these transcripts as a full-length product will be transported into the cytoplasm to be translated. Others have splice sites that are going to remove 
the RNA encoding for the GAG and the polymerase gene, reseal those thing, the, those two ends to now put out a shortened form, a spliced form of the messenger RNA that can now produce, this is a typo, this should be on ENV, not EVN, um, the envelope. These are the glycoproteins, the GP120 and GP41 proteins um, are made from this. So you have to have at least one splicing event for a retrovirus in order to be able to express the envelope genes. So this shows it in a little bit better detail. So the uh, promoter is in the long-term repeat, and it's activated at a particular time. This is kind of the, um, so we talked about that NF kappa B process, um, binding sites being upstream or in that long-term repeat. That allows for the retrovirus DNA to lie quiescent within unactivated cells. If, 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 a, if a resting T cell, for instance, a T lymphocyte is infected, that T cell will not express the RNA for the retrovirus until it becomes activated by, by a cytokine or something, something along that line. Then it will begin to express the messenger RNA for this retrovirus, for, for HIV. It's going to be 5 prime methylguanosine cap. It's going to be 3 prime polyadenylated. Um, and it can be sent out into the cytoplasm where it can be translated. Now, there are actually, there's a stop codon right here at the end of the GAG protein, shown by this asterisk. So this full-length messenger RNA is going to be translated right up until the stop codon after the GAG gene. That's going to be translated into a large polyprotein. Again, this is similar to poliovirus. We talked about poliovirus producing a massive protein that was proteolytically cleaved. Well, this is the same kind of a process, but on a smaller scale. The GAG protein has amino acid sequence in it which have proteolytic activity that has the ability to now cleave itself into all of the mature capsid proteins as well as the mature protease protein. But at this particular point, you're, we haven't expressed the polymerase gene because there's a stop codon here after the GAG gene. This stop codon after the GAG gene is not always effective. Many times when the ribosome reaches this stop codon, I shouldn't say many times, but maybe one out of ten times. I'll, that, I'm making this frequency up. But let's say one out of ten times that a ribosome reaches this stop codon at the end of GAG gene, it does not disassociate. Instead, what it does is it gets confused. There is a sequence, I'm going to hop ahead a slide just a bit. There is a sequence of DNA that's right around that stop codon at GAG that forms what's known as an RNA pseudonaut. That's what's shown here. So we've seen stem loop structures before, and this is a slight variation on a stem loop structure. Here's the stem, here's the loop, but in an RNA pseudonaut, there's an, an additional complexity to that secondary structure where the three prime end of that um, RNA actually base pairs with a part of the loop. There is something about this structure which at some frequency confuses a ribosome such that the ribosome changes its reading frame. It doesn't disassociate and fall off it backs up a nucleotide, or perhaps it jumps forward a nucleotide, but it now ignores that stop codon at the end of GAG, and instead continues to, promote, um, to produce the polymerase protein. But it doesn't do this as frequently as it makes the GAG protein. So this GAG protein will accumulate much faster than the gag Paul gene. And this is important, because the GAG gene because it takes many, many capsid proteins to make a viral capsid, needs to be expressed at a very high level. And so this, this occurs very early in the infection. The polymerase gene, which is now fused as a protein with gag Paul, this one out of 10 times when the ribosome did what's known as a programmed frame shift at that RNA pseudonaut, this will now be processed by that same proteolytic activity into two mature proteins, the reverse transcriptase that we just talked about, as well as the integrase. 
Those two proteins are made together from the polymerase gene. But since these products are not necessary inside that cell at this particular point, they don't need to be synthesized as early or at as high a level as the gag proteins. So this is a wonderful, highly evolved system that ensures that large amounts of the capsid proteins and the proteolytic enzyme to process them are produced early in the infection. And then those final products, the polymerase, uh, the reverse transcriptase, and the integrase, which are only necessary to, to infect the subsequent cells, are made at lower levels, and they're made late in, in the infection. So this explains how you get that first expression of the GAG and the Paul genes. But at this particular point, the polymerase, the stop codon at the end of the polymerase, doesn't have an RNA pseudonym. It doesn't have a way to confuse the ribosome. The ribosome disassociates every time. It never changes reading frames and translates the envelope protein genes. In this particular formation, as shown here on the top, where you have the full-length genome of HIV or a retrovirus, the envelope gene can never be translated. So this would result in no possible no possibility of creating new baby viruses from this because you don't have those envelope proteins. So this is where that, alter that splicing comes in. So some of the transcripts are going to come out of that nucleus full length, and then others are going to be um, spliced. And this is an unusual situation because those of you who are or have taken cell biology realize that you know, our cells have a lot of different means to make sure that we don't transport unspliced messenger RNA into the cytoplasm. Retroviruses have come up with ways to, to circumvent those safety mechanisms, and they have to, because the only way to express the envelope protein as a polyprotein is to export this spliced form. So that's what's shown by this downward triangle. This portion of the RNA is removed, so there are two splice sites in there. They're knitted together, and then the ribosome will bind to that shortened RNA and translate the full, full length envelope protein. In the case of HIV, this full length envelope protein is referred to as GP160. 160 referring to the size of the protein in kilodaltons or thousands of daltons. That GP160 is now proteolytically cleaved by that same polymerase, excuse me, that same protease protein into GP41 and GP120, the two proteins that we talked about that initiated the um, binding of the host cell and the fusion of the viral envelope with the host cell envelope. So again, this is just those um, the pseudonauts. So the polymerase gene is also processed into the mature forms. We, we covered this already. The polymerase is, is proteolytically cleaved in reverse transcriptase and integrase. And for that envelope gene to be expressed, there has to be processing of the viral messenger RNA to remove, to remove those. And I think I've covered each one of those, those bullets. So here's just another way to, to look at, at this from, from a different um, textbook. So here is the, the long terminal repeat. So now when you see a long terminal repeat, you know that reverse transcriptase has completed its activity and integrase has inserted it into the host chromosome. So now you have all of these enhancer sequences, transcriptional start signals, that are going to start the transcription at the beginning of this R sequence, or the repeat sequence. So if you draw an arrow from this cap site, where it says cap site, down to this RNA, that's where transcription begins. So notice that the transcript does not have a long terminal repeat. It has only the repeat sequence and the unique 5 prime end. This becomes 7 methylguanosine capped. The 3 prime end becomes polyadenylated, just like any other host messenger RNA. This can be in full length, and is in full length, transported into the cytoplasm to be translated. 90% of the translation product from any one of these messenger RNA molecules is going to encode only the gag protein which is going to be subsequently proteolytically processed into all of the final capsid proteins, the protease. Um, and about 10% of the translation products of any one of those messenger RNAs 
is going to have the GAG Pro and Paul. But, and and that, that polymerase protein is now going to be subsequently proteolytically cleaved into the reverse transcriptase. And although it's not listed in this particular slide, this is a shortcoming of this textbook, was that um, the integrase is also um, cleaved from that um, polymerase gene. Um, so that's what happens with the unprocessed forms. But you'll notice that in, in, no, in no case ever does that full-length messenger RNA ever lead to the expression of the envelope proteins. That's what happens when you have splicing of the RNA genome or the RNA full-length messenger RNA so that now when that's transported outside into the cytoplasm, it can be translated into the envelope proteins which will be then processed into the mature forms of the envelope glycoproteins. Now, that's the simple case. That's what happens if you have a simple retrovirus that just has GAG, Paul, and on. HIV, and that's compl complicated enough, but in HIV, there are actually multiple genes, and so there are multiple splices that must, must occur. So here's the HIV genome at the DNA level, Here's a long-term repeat on each end. And it has, just like every retrovirus does, the GAG, Paul, and ON gene. But it has other accessory proteins, which are very important for the function of, of HIV. We won't go through all of them, but VPR, REV, VPU. And you'll notice, if you look closely at this, you'll see that, for instance, the REV gene, shown here with this cross-hatching in pink, actually exists in two different reading frames that requires a splice event to pull them together. It's the same thing with the TAT gene, shown with, a, with I think this is a purple crosshatch. The TAT gene exists in two different reading frames that requires um, a processing event of the messenger RNA. So in HIV-1 genomes, and HIV-2 as well, Messenger RNAs go out into the cytoplasm as full length, as singly spliced, and as doubly spliced, but at different splice sites. So there are at least five different forms, alternatively spliced forms, of HIV RNA, um, RNA that need to go out into the cytoplasm in order to express each one of these accessory proteins for, for the retrovirus. So what are these accessory proteins? So it, there's much too much information on this slide for me to expect you to, to memorize, so, so please don't. I put in blue, I added my, my take on this, although blue is not um, coming out very well today on the screen, but here, these arrows on the right-hand side, these are the ones that I want to talk a little bit about. But this is also a really good slide for your general information in that you see that the GAG protein here is processed into several different sized proteins. P standing just for protein, meaning it's not glycosylated. So this would be viral protein 17 kilodaltons, 24 kilodaltons, 9 kilodaltons, and 7 kilodaltons. Those are all being proteolytically cleaved from that one GAG polyprotein, very much akin to the processing that we talked about with the polio um, protein. Then there's the polymerase gene product that's, trans, um, that's proteolytically cleaved into the protease, the reverse transcriptase, and the integrase. And these are the sizes of, of those molecules. Reverse transcriptase is a very complicated enzyme. It actually exists as a heterodimer uh, of two different sizes that are cleaved from that, from that polymerase. And then, of course, there's the envelope gene down here that's processed from GP160 into GP120 and GP41. GP41 being that transmembrane protein that led to the fusion. But some of these other regulatory proteins are pretty amazing things, like REV that I mentioned. REV mediates transport of these unspliced transcripts. So it binds to uh, molecules or proteins inside the nucleus of the cell that normally prevent unspliced forms of messenger RNA from being transported. I don't understand the process very well, um, there are probably people in this classroom who have taken cell biology who understand it better than me. But REV is what allows this virus to actually be able to transport those multiply processed forms of RNA into the, into the genome. NEF, this negative factor, actually downregulates CD4 expression. Why is this important? 
We actually talked about this a little bit um, when we talked about um, F plasmids. Remember the F plasmids, which in my estimation are nothing but highly evolved viruses, they actually have a means to downregulate the receptor for conjugation. So cells don't bother to conjugate cells that already have the F plasma. It's the same thing with the retrovirus, with HIV. Rather than have HIV virions infect a cell that's already infected, the NEF factor will downregulate this absolutely required portion of the co-receptor, CD4. That, that reduces the, the efficiency with which new viruses can infect that cell. Um, DPU is another really clever enzyme that HIV has come up with to help disassociate the virus um, from, that, from that cell upon, in, upon infection. I'm going to talk about a little bit about that because as it turns out, there is a process that HIV actually helped us to discover whereby when cells are infected with a virus, one of the responses based on interferon response is the production of a protein that tends to hold on to viruses. So when, you're, when your cells or my cells are infected with a virus like, like HIV, one of the things that our cells do is they release a product called interferon. You've probably all heard of this. And it induces in neighboring cells an antiviral state. So it's, it's basically warning neighboring cells that there is a virus that, that one cell has been infected with, and so now there's the possibility that other cells could be infected. Well, one of the things in that infected cell that occurs is the production of a protein called tetherin. And I'll show you a picture of it in a little bit. Tetherin actually tends to hold on to those viruses as they're trying to bud, bud from the cell. It's this protein that makes the cells, or the viruses, stick to the cells to prevent other cells from being infected. So that hopefully your immune system kills that cell producing the viruses and the viral infection can be limited. It's a very nice, very effective way that we have to combat viral infections. Well, HIV has adapted to that very well. That's what this VPU protein is. It actually cleaves that tetherin protein to allow the virus to now no longer be stuck to the cell. This is very much akin, and as you know, I like compare and contrast kinds of things. This is very similar to what neuraminidase does in influenza. Remember that neuraminidase cleaves off the sialic acid portion of the receptor of influenza to allow the virus to um, float free from that cell that it's just infected. VPU is doing largely the same thing in a completely independent manner um, in, in this retrovirus. So here's a, uh, an image from the textbook that actually does a really good job at going step by step through the infectious process of, of influenza. So beginning up here at, at step one, you have the HIV particle attaching via its GP120, or shown here as SU, um, to CCR5 and CD4. Then there's a membrane fusion that occurs between the viral envelope at step two. The thing that I also like about this slide is, because I don't really have time to, to talk about chemotherapeutic agents in HIV infection, but this slide actually introduces a couple of them. Um, AZT, which you may have heard of as a drug that's used to treat um, HIV um, and to treat prophylactically people who've been exposed to HIV, AZT actually blocks reverse transcriptase because reverse transcriptase is going to occur in this cytoplasmic portion of the transit. So upon dumping of this nucleocapsid after membrane fusion into the cytoplasm, this is what activates reverse transcriptase. So this core protein made up of these gag proteins becomes a little bit leaky um, at this point, and that allows for the reverse transcriptase to transcribe the negative strand, uh, or to transcribe that messenger RNA, uh, in essence, the messenger RNA of the retrovirus, into double-stranded DNA, which is actually what's going to be transported into the nucleoplasm of that cell via the nuclear pore complex. That, um, that process, reverse transcriptase, is blocked by AZT. That RNA, now turned into double-stranded DNA with its long terminal repeats, is going to be inserted into the genome randomly of that host. Some of the proteins are going to be synthesized from full-length messenger RNA, Others are going to be spliced. 
you're going to get the large amounts of the gag precursor protein, which is going to be cleaved into all of those mature capsid proteins, and then a smaller amount of the gag pol promoter, shown, shown here as a single molecule that's going to be processed uh, into the reverse transcriptase and, and integrase. There are protease inhibitors that people have designed using computer programs. So this is one of the um, few examples, or maybe the first example, of somebody using a computer program to model a drug to interact with protease inhibitors. So one of the major drugs that's used in heart therapy, or highly active antiretroviral therapy, uh, are protease inhibitors. And these were designed using computer programs. Um, that tends to block protease in inhibitors. Um, you'll have the envelope proteins, the GP120 and GP41, assembling in rafts at the, at the mem on the membrane of that infected cell. Very similar to the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase story with, with influenza. These proteins, the GAG, Paul, and um, protease proteins are going to assemble with messenger RNA and bud off from, from that cell. Now, this is the part that I think is just really cool um, and actually very evil when it comes to retroviruses. This tetherin protein that I was talking about. So tetherin is induced um, only upon viral infection. This is not a protein that's normally expressed within cells. Cells need to um, be infected by a virus. It triggers an interferon response. And one of the genes that is regulated, and there are many genes that are regulated by interferon, is this tetherin gene. And what it does is it, it basically it's like a string holding onto a balloon. So what the virus is trying to do here in this electron micrograph is to bud off from this infected cell to be released free to, uh, to infect other cells or, or naive um, other hosts. But the tethering protein you can see right here actually holds on to that um, retrovirus. Unfortunately, in the case of HIV, it has a protein that leaves that tethering protein. So, so that allows the virus to get away with, to, it, has, it has outsmarted that portion of, of the interferon antiviral state. Here's just another way to, to look at this, this tethering um, between, between these two. But it's a really clever system that, that we've evolved um, using our interferon system that HIV has found, found a way around. And so just as a last thing, because we're going to we're stopping talking about viruses now, um, See, you'll never catch me. Here's a virus. These are like inflammatory cells. You know, he's right. Technically, he's not alive. So always remember that viruses in this argument that people will try and have with you, whether viruses are alive or dead, they are not. They are not. They are biological molecules. They're biological entities, but they are not alive. And so when we come back after Thanksgiving, we'll start talking about back to bacteria and diseases. So have a great Thanksgiving. Travel safely, everyone, and I'll see you next Monday. Oh, and there's a review session tonight, 5.30 to 6.30 in the teaching lab.